Hello friends. So today's video is going to be a May new releases wrap up specifically for fantasy books. And the three main books I'm going to be talking about would be Book of Night, Electra, and The Stardust Thief. There is another book that I'm going to talk about that technically came out last month. I didn't know about this book until this month and it's actually thanks to one of you. I did a video recently talking about books that I think would be great if they were talked about a little bit more here on booktube. And one of you mentioned this other author, and I really want to spend some time talking about it, even though it technically came out in April. That book would be Nettle and Bone. I'll have timestamps for these, so if you want to skip to any individual book, you can. But this one, I... Uh, it's a new favorite. I had so much fun with this book, so thank you to the person who recommended this author. I've never read anything by them. The author would be T. Kingfisher. I believe they write under a different name depending on the age range that they're writing in. And I think some of their writing is technically considered in the horror genre and not necessarily fantasy. This one though, it's not very long. It's quite short. And I have always found I have a lot of difficulty getting into shorter works, especially shorter fantasy, because there's just so much to take in. And sometimes just not there's not enough time when it's that short to feel really connected to the characters, to feel connected to the story, to have the story feel like it's got a very satisfying ending. But man, I just felt like it was the perfect amount of time. I love the pacing. The story is going to sound really familiar when I talk about the premise. The um, length of the book, for those of you who are like, well, how short is it? It's only 240 pages. But if you're looking for a fantastic adult fantasy standalone. Check this one out, especially too if you're unsure. The fact that it's so short, I mean, you can finish it <laughs> in an evening. I devoured this. I kept stopping and then just, I could have tabbed it, but I kept taking pictures with my phone and I would text my husband like, this is hilarious. And I would send him a, a screenshot or I would text my friend Ashana who has her own channel. I'm like, you have to pick this book up. It's so funny. And it's funny, but it's sad. And I feel like the plot sounds very tragic, but it's basically like what you would expect if a author now was writing a grim fairy tale. To the point where I was like, is this a retelling of something? Because it just has that feeling. So finally getting around to what it's about. And I said before, it's going to sound like nothing too unique, but I promise it's, it's fantastic and it's fun and it does. Okay. Anyway, let me just get to the plot. So it follows this girl who's been raised in a convent and her sister has been married off to this prince. And it's very important that they secure this alliance. Otherwise, this kingdom that she is a part of is at risk of being conquered. They sort of need their daughter, the king and queen. They need their daughter to marry this prince to have the security of that army. However, it comes to light that the prince is unkind, to put it lightly, to our main character's sister. And when our main character finds this out, she is determined to help her sister escape this terrible situation that she is in. And she has to figure out a way to do it where it doesn't then put her entire kingdom in jeopardy, because obviously if she just runs up and tries to murder the king or something, then they're going to retaliate. So she's going on this quest to figure out how she can try. Let me hold this up so you can get a nice view of the cover. So it's like imprinted <laughs> because I really want other people to read it. So she is going kind of on this little quest to figure out how to secure all the things that she needs to accomplish this impossible task. And so there's so many quotes at the beginning that have to do with just the way people are treated. It's very moving. The, the unfairness and the unjustness in the world, that is really well done in, like I said, such a short amount of time at the beginning, and then as our journey, I'll call it, is taking place, there's just so much to it that is hilarious. And so our main character kind of, she always just considers herself kind of dull, and she's like, I'm not very bright. She doesn't really think very highly of herself, and she's like, I just like knitting and stuff. I don't have a whole lot to offer. And that's not your typical main character. It's not like she's secretly amazing and a great fighter and she's really good at magic. No, she's just like, I don't have much going for me, but I gotta try. And you're like, wow, that's unfortunate that you don't have much going for you because it's gonna make this harder. But she tries anyway. And she partners with this, um, we'll call her a witch. They call them different things. 
But she partners with a woman that is essentially a witch, a woman who is kind of like a fairy godmother, and then also this former guard. And this party bands together to try and accomplish this impossible task. And the guard, I mean, all the characters I loved. I loved them all so much. They all had such distinct personalities. I loved him, though. He's like the honorable man guard trope that's just... It's perfect. The way he's done is perfect. I loved him so much. And they're both just, they're all good people. You know, they're all trying. And I think so often nowadays in fantasy, we see like gray morality. And I love that. But sometimes it's fun to follow people that just feel like people trying to do the right thing. And especially when they're going up against something that you kind of feel for them because you're like, yeah, things are unfair. And I just loved all of them. And this book I mentioned earlier, it's funny. It's hilarious there's so much to it that i was like okay and it's kind of a little bit absurd sometimes and if you're looking for a story with like an interesting magic system that's really well fleshed out stuff that's not what you're gonna get with this because again it feels very fairy tale like so the magic just was like oh yeah this 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 thing so an example there's a there's so many quotes in this book that i could read from and the way that the author describes things is great so let me take a I'm gonna mention a couple of the quotes. I'm gonna start by reading one that I feel like is a good example of just, this is how much explanation you get for the magic, but it's just enough and it's funny and you're like, it's not really that important to the plot, so I'll roll with it. Um, a little context here, the witch-like character has this chicken <laughs> and already I'm giggling because it sounds so silly, but she has this chicken and she's always like, ah, there's a demon in that chicken. And she's always talking about that. And at one point the character says, do you mean that your chicken has a literal demon in her? Not that she's just a dot dot dot, a bad chicken. And it says the words sounded incredibly foolish as she said them. And the dust wife's look indicated that they did not improve upon hearing. The explanation the dust wife gives, she says, girl, have I given you any indication in the last week that I joke about anything? How did you get a demon in your chicken? The usual way. I couldn't put it in a rooster. That's how you get basilisks. That's hilarious. The way that the author manages to describe how somebody is, their movement and their expressions. I haven't really read a story where I feel like those sorts of things stand out to me because usually they're pretty simple. They're the usual like, oh, they gasped or they furrowed their brows or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with those. They get the job done. But this author goes above and beyond. They always have just the, the best, like so many times I wish I was like, dang it, I, I should have tabbed that. But this part, once again, another thing to do with a chicken, they're looking for a, a baby chicken specifically. And our main character is like, where? <laughs> this book probably sounds like nonsense to a lot of you. It's great. But there's a part where the main character is like, where are we going to get a baby chicken? Like she doesn't know what to do. And the guy, the guard guy is like, I'll just go ask somebody. So he goes up to some vendor, we'll call them, that's selling pickles. And he says, uh, he's asking him where to find a baby chicken. And the, the person says, are you sure you don't want a pickle instead? Much less trouble than a fowl. Sadly, I do not. Not even such fine pickles. Fenris put a hand over his heart, somehow managing to indicate a profound sense of loss at his inability to eat the pickle in question. And maybe all of you are like, who cares? Whatever. I don't need you to read those to us, but I'm just like, it's funny. It's that kind of stuff throughout while still being really moving. And there were moments where I'm like, oh, wow, that really hit hard in 200 something pages. Anyway, check out Nettle and Bone. And thank you to the person who recommended this author because I thoroughly enjoyed this. And this author has a new book coming out very soon and I'm going to pre-order it because I'm now a fan. In case you forgot also, it's a standalone, so. I know a lot of people are always looking for some fantasy standalones. Anyway, moving now into some of the other new releases. These literally came out in May. So first we have Book of Night. This is one of those that I feel like it was unavoidable hearing people's thoughts about it. I think a lot of people have been kind of disappointed. I've seen quite a few people DNFing this book. I, I did make it to the end. <laughs> but I think that this is a, a case of a lot of the ideas are really cool. And a lot of times when I am picking up a new release, I try not to look at what other people are saying because I really wanna make sure that when I tell you all my thoughts about them, that they're not sort of affected by other people. And sometimes that's hard to avoid, especially with one as popular as Holly Black. But for the most part, I read it before seeing other people's thoughts. And I kept thinking to myself like, 
I mean, I know sometimes I can be stupid. <laughs> There's plenty of times I can be dumb. But I was like, I mean, I don't get it. <laughs> um, I, I didn't feel like I ever had a grasp on the magic. The concept was really cool. So it has to do with shadows. And it takes place more in modern day. And the shadows, you find out, or, or society has discovered, that there is magic associated with a person's shadow. And when I say I didn't get it, I mean that just to what extent could be done with shadows, I didn't always feel like I had a good grasp on. Because there's a lot of information that's delivered to you. But I almost feel like this book was a hybrid of too many things, because in some ways it's a mystery. It's almost like a whodunit to some degree. It's not like there's there is technically a body that's found early on, but I wouldn't say it's like, oh, someone was murdered. Who did it? It's not quite like that, but there is a sense of there's something going on and there's someone doing it and you're trying to figure out who. And then our main character is also edgy. And so you get this uh, perspective from the past that is sort of outlining our character, how she got to where she is because she has a little bit of a criminal background. And so you have this modern day sort of whodunit plotline. You have a backstory plotline that really does serve as a character examination. It's showing you how the character got to be where they are, but also emotionally and mentally, how they function, how they see things, the trauma that they're carrying with them, you get that. But then also there are aspects of their past that do tie to present day in a way that is kind of a twist. And I enjoyed seeing how that all played out. I liked the idea of the magic. Uh, an example of something with the shadows that I thought was really cool is that you can sort of detach your shadow from you and then it can do things separate from you. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's onyx, but there's some kind of material that people use to ensure that the shadows can't steal things from them, for example. So if the shadow has the ability to kind of go under a door because it can flatten itself and all these things, if it tries to get something where, like I said, I believe it's onyx, if that is in this a safe, for example, then the shadow becomes solid and it can't then like go through things like you would normally expect it to. So there's these details that I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And some people are trying to live on and gain immortality through their shadows. And once again, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And there's a specific book that they believe has a lot of information about how to go about things because this magic was not really known and out in the open for so long. And now that it is, there are a lot of magic users who are trying to figure out the ins and outs of the magic. But even the information that is known to society and is known to our character, I felt like whenever that information was delivered to me, it was for some reason hard to grasp and hold on to. So I'll, I know I often reference Mistborn when talking about magic systems, but with Mistborn, you get these rules established and then you get reminders of how that magic works or how that rule impacts the character. So for example, if a character ingests metals that give them a certain power, once they've burned through those metals, they can't use that power anymore. And in this, I just didn't feel like I was getting that confirmation of like, here, see, this is how it works. See here, how's th this is how this works. And it left me not it left me almost feeling like I was behind the whole time. And when I was reading it, the reason I was talking about initially how I was avoiding what other people were saying is I was like, I'm just stupid because I don't, man, maybe I should go back and tab. But then I saw a bunch of other people that were like, I don't know what's going on with the magic. I don't understand things. I don't think things are fleshed out. So it would seem that this is a common criticism of this book. Now, I also want to add that having these two different timelines in a not very long book, oh, I have a, a fun addition. I'm going to link the person who did this um, because it is a cool, I really like the design. But anyway, because the book is not all that long, I think it's tricky to do backstory chapters in a way that feels like it's enhancing the story and it's not relying on this form of storytelling to establish what you might be able to establish in present day. Uh, so it can feel disjointed. And I think maybe it did feel a little disjointed. There is a, a big twist at the end, or maybe kind of a reveal would be a better way to put it. And it ended up making this book feel like one big prologue. I am still interested in picking up the sequel. And if there are, if there is even going to be a sequel, but it definitely leaves you thinking that there will be. I would be curious to see what the author does with the sequel. If I don't love the second one, 
I probably won't continue on with the series, but at the very least, I think it's an it might be a fun book to buddy read to pick up with other people because I think there's a lot to have opinions about. Next up, we have Electra. This is by the same author who wrote Ariadne that came out not all that long ago, and I quite enjoyed Ariadne. I was very excited for Electra because I specifically really enjoyed the writing in Ariadne. I know that retellings can be very tricky because there are some people that are like, no, this is how this should happen in this retelling, or based off of this time period, they should feel this way, or they should, this should be their custom towards this, or, the, and there's specifics that matter a lot to certain readers, and I'm just not that person. So I'm sure there are other individuals out there that have more knowledge about that specifically. And if you're that kind of person with your mythology retellings, I'm not that kind of a person. So maybe it would be better to find someone else and see their thoughts. But as just a, a reader of fantasy and somebody who enjoys retellings, I really enjoyed this book quite a bit. So I have found that this author in both Ariadne and Electra, they are focusing on characters that you don't typically see as much about in these stories. So this is in a lot of ways about Troy, which a lot of us have seen, Achilles, Agamemnon, we've we've heard those names, we're familiar with those names. So Clytemestra is Agamemnon's wife, Electra is their daughter, and then Cassandra is somebody who is in Troy. And she's somebody who has this curse, essentially, to see things to come, but nobody believes her. And then Clytemestra, I don't wanna say too much if you don't know anything about the original, but something happens to someone that Clytemestra cares about, and now she wants revenge. So much so that it consumes her. It does not make her as attentive as a mother as she once was to Electra and her other children. And that kind of creates this distance between the characters. And Electra is very frustrated because she feels like the person who was harmed, the way in which they were harmed, she feels like was a great honor. And so therefore doesn't understand why her mother feels the way that they do. And a big theme in the story is the cycle of hatred, the cycle of violence. And I just felt like the way the author did it was great. Now, this is a very slow moving story. It's a tragedy. And so it's a big bummer of a book. It's I say a big bummer, like emotionally, not the size of the book. This also is not all that long, but I, I just really enjoy this author's writing with Ariadne. I felt like that one was more so centered on humans interacting with gods. And in this one, it's more about humanizing these characters from mythology, even though they themselves are not gods and goddesses, it still is bringing about a human side to them in a way that we in modern day can connect to while still trying to tie in the customs and the culture of that time. And so I understood why Electra felt the way she did, but I was like, Team Clytemestra. I was like, you get that revenge. And I really, I was like pumped at the end. I'm like, nothing better mess this up. Nothing better mess this up because I want them to get this revenge, even though I know the whole point is to show how violence is bad. But I was like, oh, I feel her pain. And with Electra, I understood why she felt the way she did. I understood that sense of betrayal and that sense of isolation, but man, did I, I didn't dislike Electra because of how she felt about the main uh, plot. There was something how she behaves toward the end and how she treats another person. And I'm like, <sighs> fine. And I, it's funny because after I finished it, I was like, what do other people think? <laughs> and I found somebody that was like, I hated Electra, but they didn't hate her in a love to hate way. They hated her in a way that kind of affected their enjoyment of the book. But I, I feel like the way the author writes these characters, I could see people loving different characters in the book or hating different characters in the book and coming away with different feelings. So with Book of Night, I was saying it could be a fun book to buddy read with people because there's a lot of opinions out there. With this one, I can just see people connecting to such different things within it. And so I ended up really liking it. The more I think about it, the more I'm like, oh man, that was good. And there's one character that their plot line is just so sad. And I was like, man, I guess that was a sad life for you. Anyway, I really quite liked it. If you've picked it up and had completely different opinions, I would love to hear your thoughts. And if you've really loved it also, I would love to see if you're somewhere in the middle. In general, I would just love to know for those of you who have picked it up, what your thoughts were. And if you've read both this one and Ariadne, which one did you personally like more? 
Last, we have the Stardust Thief. This was one I was so excited about, and it was a lot of fun. It's an adventure story. It's a traveling story. And I really quick, I made sure to uh, have a certain part open. One of the things I loved about the book is the emphasis on stories. So it's a lot of the A Thousand and One Nights as its inspiration. The author talks about how they grew up hearing a lot of these stories, and so this is kind of their take on a lot of it. And with the emphasis of stories, there are times throughout the book where the characters are telling stories or someone else is telling a story and the way it's tied into what is happening on this adventure there's like these formal uh parts that just it feels like a separate thing and the way that was done both in how the author incorporated it but also just in general the literal printing of the stories i just thought made it a little extra that little extra touch i really enjoyed I wouldn't say I enjoyed this book really for any of the characters themselves. I'm a very character-driven reader, and I didn't love anyone. I didn't really hate anyone also. I felt like they had distinct personalities. We have one woman who is the Midnight Merchant. She is somebody who, she finds these specific items that have a lot of value. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to reveal a whole lot about them. And there's kind of a twist about those items throughout the story that you find out. But she sells these magical rare items and she sort of has this reputation. And you are finding out that there is more to her past. There's things that have happened that are quite tragic. And she has this Jin bodyguard. I really liked their relationship quite a bit. But we have this character. And then we also have somebody who, if they're described as a coward, but really they're just like, what most of us would probably be like if we were in a fantasy world where they try and they're nice and they do what they can, but they also, they, they don't want to be stuck inside. They want to have an adventure. And then when they actually go on an adventure, they're like, this sucks. And then they get really panicked and scared, understandably, because stuff that happens can be quite frightening in the story. And then we have a character who is sort of almost like an assassin type. And she means business and she's real serious all the time. And she has a past also. And she sort of has her loyalties lying elsewhere. And you see these characters traversing the desert, going to these different cities, and the encounters with different djinn, and the encounters with people from their past, and you have this adventure. And I thought it was a lot of fun. I definitely am very curious about the sequel, especially with where things leave off in this first book, because I had fun with this first one, but I'm thinking that the second one is going to feel a little bit more fantastical. And I'm really excited for the setup that we have been we've been given. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a new favorite currently, but I do think that there's a lot of potential for where the series is going to go. I believe it's going to be, yes, it says the Sand Seat Trilogy. So we have two more books and I'm very excited to see where it goes. That's it for some new releases that I picked up. If you have read any of these, let me know your thoughts. If you haven't, but you're now interested, let me know that as well. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you all later. Bye.